And we, at the Center for Political Innovation, we take this seriously. I'm often joked that a lot of people that call themselves Marxists or leftists, they think it's Little League Baseball. And what do they tell kids in Little League Baseball? It's not about whether you win or lose, it's just how you play the game, right? If you just do everything right, it doesn't matter if we actually get socialism. If we can make ourselves feel good and, and have rallies and we can chant all the right political slogans, it doesn't matter. And if we can just prove that we're the most morally pure and all of that, that's what we can do. And it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and it's not serious politics. At the Center for Political Innovation, we do offer serious politics. We can offer a number of things that you won't get from other voices speaking in the name of socialism. Number one, we offer a clear definition of what socialism and capitalism actually are. Uh, it's pretty basic, right? If you're going to go advocating socialism, you ought to have, you know, going to go ad ad denouncing capitalism, you ought to know what these things are. But we're pretty clear about what they are. Capitalism is a system of production organized for profit. As Frederick Engels said, under capitalism, the means of production only function as preliminary transformation into capital, meaning that we don't have food so people can eat it. We have food so big box stores and agribusiness can make profit selling it. And under capitalism, we don't have housing so people can live in it. We have housing so landlords and banks and others can make profits selling it. Under capitalism, money is in charge. Profits are in command, as Mao Zedong, the leader of the Chinese Revolution, said. That's capitalism. Capitalism is a system of production organized for profit. And socialism is the abolition of capitalism. It's when you have a government based in communities, serving the people, that forces the economy to work in the interests of the people. And profits are no longer in command. It's when the economy is organized to serve public good, not the profits of a few. Socialism is a government of action that controls the means of production and organizes them for the benefit of society. It's a government of action that fights for working families. So we have a clear definition of socialism and capitalism. And it's socialism that made Russia and China into the strong countries they are today. And it's socialism that made Cuba an island with a medical system that's admired all over the world. And when Libya was socialist under the leadership of Gaddafi, it had the highest life expectancy on the African continent. And it was, was, had, was doing amazingly well. People were trying to get into Libya, to get jobs, uh, you know, in the, the prosperous economy that existed there. And now that Libya has been bombed back into the open, free trade, international capitalist system, people are drowning in the Mediterranean trying to get out of Libya. And it's pretty clear around the world, you can see the results. Vietnam has had great success with their socialist market economy. And let's be clear, there's room for private businesses in a socialist society, right? The idea that everything must be run by the state is not practical, and we've learned that. You know, China was able to adjust their economy, and as a result of adjusting their economy to have a market sector, but yet keeping the state in control, keeping five-year economic plans, keeping government control of banking, uh, regulating and controlling the economy, they've been able to have great successes in economic growth. I, I don't think there's any need for the government to run the restaurants or the government to run the hotels. I don't think that the private sector should be in charge of the banking system. Things like healthcare, things like education, things like essential infrastructure should be controlled by society. And furthermore, if you go to China, one of the realities in China is that even the private companies are not really operating according to profit, because at any point, the Chinese Communist Party can come in and say, no, you're going to do this, and force them to work in the interests of society. And you look at these huge mega corporations like Huawei Technologies, and you look at the great fusion energy research they're doing, it's pretty clear that in China, despite the fact that there is a market sector, despite the fact that a lot of people are getting wealthy, profits are not in command. And it's breaking out of the irrational rule of profits that has enabled China to be so prosperous. And that is where socialism is in the 21st century. Cuba wants to be more like China. Venezuela wants to be more like China. Nicaragua wants to be more like China. This model of organizing the economy to serve public good and allowing a market sector to exist for the benefit of a, of a socialist society, this is an effective way of, of organizing an economy. The Soviet Union was unable to, to make the changes necessary to preserve their socialism. With perestroika and glasnost, they tried to adjust the socialist system, but they did it in a way that, 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 destroyed, that destroyed the Soviet Union. They weren't unable to bend, so they broke. But China is constantly reinventing itself and constantly adjusting its socialist system to be more effective. And what Xi Jinping is doing right now with his mass line campaigns and his crackdowns on corruption is showing how resilient and how ever-changing Chinese socialism is. And there's plenty for us to learn from. Another thing that we offer 
is that we have a clear definition of imperialism. So what is imperialism? Imperialism is when you send troops to a country, right? No, no, imperialism is, is Star Wars, I think Peter's talked about, right? It's, it's Star Wars, it's, it's, it's the- Star Wars, Yeah. it's country do bad thing. Country do bad thing. Well, no, imperialism is capitalism in its monopoly stage. It is the rule of the world by big banks and corporations based in Western countries, grinding countries into poverty, keeping the world poor, and making the world poorer so that Wall Street and London can stay rich. That's what imperialism is. And the countries around the world that are having great successes and lifting their people out of poverty, like Nicaragua that we heard about from David, these are countries that have broken out of imperialism. And our mission is to break the United States out of imperialism and rebuild the United States as a society free from the rule of multinational corporations and banks, force the economy to serve public good, reorganize the economy to serve the people. So another thing that we can offer is we can offer a clear understanding of the failures of the American left. Why is it that the United States Marxist and Socialist movement is so weak? Why is it so weak? It's so weak because it is a fact that in 1949, the CIA launched their Congress for Cultural Freedom program and began manipulating left-wing organizations, funneling money to Trotskyites and anarchists and anti-socialist elements. It is a that we have seen George Soros' dirty hands all through the organized political left. Foundation money is used to corrupt organizations, to push identity politics and a message that's not consistent, to obscure class struggle. It is a fact that Project MK Ultra was launched by the CIA to push LSD and drugs into left-wing spaces, to push pessimism and Eastern mysticism and hopelessness in order to manipulate our movement. It is a fact. And furthermore, it is a fact that Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube and Bread Tube are being funded by the British Empire and the British royal family. This is a fact. This is a fact, folks. Who told you about bread tube? Who told you that bread tube serves imperialism? Who told you bread tube serves imperialism? Max Blumenthal produced the smoking gun. We know, we know now who Vosh is working for. We know now who Thought Slime is working for. We know who has set up all of this. And if we didn't have the smoking gun right in front of us, uh, their behavior in relation to this Ukraine crisis would be even further proof. So there you go. Now another thing that we offer at the Center for Political Innovation is a psychological approach to cadre. Folks, my goal is for every person in the Center for Political Innovation to find strength within themselves, to find heroism. Social media is making people weaker. It's about making people afraid. It's about making people dependent on that validation. Did I get enough likes? Did I get enough approval? Does, do other people agree with me? Maybe I shouldn't have said this. It's about making people afraid to take a stand. But the great heroes of history, you want to talk about Joan of Arc, you want to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. are people that knew how to stand against the crowd. They're people who knew how to take a tough stand and refuse to back down. And that's what I would like to cultivate at the Center for Political Innovation, people that are heroic and can find their inner strength. And I'll tell you, I credit the communist movement for that in my own life. I told the story many times of when I was 15 years old, I went to a communist bookstore for a discussion it was a nice discussion about the war in Iraq or whatever. And I was in the bookstore, and then a communist handed me a stack of newspapers. They said, you know what? We're going to go out and sell the paper. I was 15 years old, and I said, wait a minute. You want me to walk up to people that I don't know and try to get them to give me actual money for a newspaper about communism? You've got to be joking. I am not doing that. I can't do that. And they're like, no, no, we do that all the time, it's fine. And they handed me a stack of newspapers and I was just, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was just nervous and I remember I, I walked up to people and I'm like, duh, do you want some information on uh, socialism? I, it was just so uncomfortable for me. But I remember the first newspaper, the first communist newspaper I ever sold, I sold it to a couple. 
And there was a couple, they were walking down the street, and I walked up to them and tried to sell them this communist newspaper. And uh, the man said, well, young man, I, I don't agree with you, but I see that you go to Oberlin College, and uh, so I'll, I'll buy it from you. I was wearing my letterman's jacket from Boorville, Ohio, so he saw the big O, and he thought I went to Oberlin College, and so I just said, I like Oberlin, and so, so he bought the newspaper from me. That's the first communist newspaper I ever sold. But believe it or not, at that point, I was quite a shy person. At that point, you know, I was quite embarrassed. My family was always saying to me, stop talking all this crazy politics, stop, stop doing that. But, but I discovered I was quite good at engaging with people about politics. And in a lot of ways, I would say the communist movement saved my life. I'll just be real about that. I wouldn't, wouldn't be where I am right now if it weren't for communism. And that's why I haven't given up on this. People say, oh, you've got a, you know, got a great job, you're a reporter and all that. Why don't you just sit back and enjoy life? No. No, I'm in this for real, folks. And we have so much that needs to be done. And the world is moving in such a dangerous direction. And we need to stand strong and keep going because there is so much that needs to be done. And that's what I want to cultivate in everyone in this organization. I want people to find the strength within themselves. I want us to stand up at these woke shops that they do. Yeah, if you've ever been to one of these woke shops, it's all about cultivating people's weakness, making people feel like children, making people feel ashamed. Yeah. If you hear me clap once, if you hear me clap twice, if you hear me clap three times, uh, now we're all gonna sit around and talk about our favorite pizza. We, yeah, we've been there. That's not what we do at the Center for Political Innovation, and I will never allow that to happen, I can guarantee you that. I'll be the first to resign if we ever start having workshops at the Center for Political Innovation. Another thing that we offer is we offer a tolerance for political diversity. I don't agree with everyone in this room about everything, and I'm sure that everyone in this room does not agree with me about everything. And I can't think of a greater example of that than two of our leading comrades. Uh, we got Lily Goldklang, stand up, and Keaton Mansfield, stand up. Now, these two people, I went to Nicaragua with them in November to monitor the elections. You could not find two people that are further apart uh, in terms of, of background and political orientation, et cetera, right? We got Keaton Mansfield, who is a conservative Catholic farm boy from rural Illinois. We've got Lily Goldklang, who is a Jewish trans woman uh, from the suburbs of Atlanta. And these are two people that would not speak to each other if it weren't for the Center for Political Innovation. These are two people that, that would never have crossed paths. But since, since last May, they have been in the same organization, putting forward the same political slogans, working to build up for the same political goals, working together. And this is what we need in the United States right now. We need to get over the red state, blue state, blue team versus red team divide. We need to bring people together. That's what we need. And we have a program that can bring the country together. That's what we have. And that's what I like to see here. That's what we have here. And I hope that many people from many different walks of life, look, you know, there are people in the organization who feel like me, that abortion should be legal and that it, it, it must be legal, right to choose. There are people in the Center for Political Innovation who don't agree with that. They say, I'm a Muslim or I'm a Christian or I'm an Orthodox Jew and I don't feel that abortion should be legal. And I'm, I'm gonna disagree with them about abortion, but they're welcome in the group. And the same goes for gay marriage and the same goes for a lot of issues. We have got to build a serious united front around an economic program to rescue this country. That's what we have to do. And that means we have to break the rules. It means we have to work with people we might not agree with. Because we're serious about this, because we actually want to get things done. Now another thing that the Center for Political Innovation offers, we offer a scientific understanding of revolution. That's the first thing we should be talking about. If we want to get from here to socialism, how do we get there? Let's be serious. Well, the process of transitioning towards socialism is generally three stages. First, there is a united front built around a program. In Russia, that program was peace, land, and bread. In China, that program was defeating the Japanese and redistributing the land. And a serious program is developed and society is mobilized around that program, a program to change society. And political leaders emerge who are supporting that program. That's the first step. And then from there, political leaders come into office or mass movements are created around that program. 
But in order to enact that program, the nature of the state has to change. We're not gonna be able to build a socialist America with the FBI and the CIA and the Pentagon functioning as they currently are. You would need a new intelligence agency. You'd need a new federal police force. You'd need a new orientation for the military. The nature of the state would have to change. In order to enact a people's program, you would need to change the nature of the state. And that's what the scientific Marxists call the dictatorship of the proletariat, when the nature of the state changes. The state goes from the hands of the capitalists to the hands of the people. And then, with the state in the hands of the people, the state can then move ahead and start creating a socialist society, a society where growth and innovation is no longer held back by the irrationality of greed. This is a three-stage process. That's why the Communist Manifesto ends with 10 planks, right? Those are the 10 planks of the United Front, and that's what communists generally do. They put forward a serious program, and we have a serious program. We have four points Four economic points that a lot of people could agree to, but not the ruling class, and not the big corporations, and not the banks. And we want to build a united front around those four planks. We want to mobilize society to get those four planks. And we understand that in order for those four planks to be enacted, the nature of the Pentagon, the police, and the military would have to change. And that with a new state, we could have a fully socialist society. This is the way communist parties operate all over the world. The, the Center for Political Innovation, the way we talk, if you go to South America, if you go to Africa, if you go to Asia, people say this is common sense. They think there's nothing remotely profound about what we're doing. But the US left is so infiltrated and so manipulated and so delusional and crazy, what we're doing here sounds very, very unique and original to people in the United States. I believe somebody accused us of trying to imitate the Communist Party. You know, the, I think there's some people in the Communist Party who said, you know, you're trying to imitate the Communist Party. Well, let me just say this. We're not trying to imitate the Communist Party because there's some pretty key differences between our approach and the approach put forward by the leaders of the Communist Party. We're what the Communist Party should be yeah. and would be. And would be if it wasn't controlled by the FBI. Let's be real about that. That's the reality. And their crazy over-the-top reaction to us is one of the biggest confirmations that we are right that I've ever seen. Let me just put it that way. Another thing I'd like to make clear is that we offer a serious political message. And we go to people with real policy solutions. If you go to working class people and say you want to have a big civil war and violently overthrow the government and destroy their neighborhood and communities, you are not serious. You come across as a lunatic. And we are very, very clear that we advocate a peaceful transition to socialism through the democratic process. We'd like to see progressives and socialists elected. We would like to see progressive legislation leading toward our four-point plan passed. That's what we would like to see. We don't advocate violence and instability. It's Joe Biden and the capitalist system and the decaying political process in the United States that is leading to violence and instability. We are offering the road to peace. We're offering the way out of the chaos. We're offering the way to stability. That's what we are offering. It's them, with cable news, with, with the social media hyper-insanity, they're the ones dividing the United States. They're the ones fomenting instability and chaos. We want to bring the country together. We want to bring an end to this. And we want peace with the people of the world. We want to start doing business with China and doing business with Russia and cooperating with countries on the basis of win-win cooperation. We want to end this open international system of greed and neoliberalism. We are offering a message of peace, jobs, democracy, equality, stability, hope, progress. We're not violent, we're not radicals, we're not extremists. We advocate a politics of common sense. It's common sense that people should have jobs. It's common sense that people should have education. It's common sense that economic growth is good and not bad. It's common sense that people should be rising out of poverty. It's common sense that fusion energy should be a priority and that we should be trying to get out of the nightmare of fossil fuels by going to a higher fuel source, not a weaker one. That's common sense, and that's what we offer. We offer the road to peace, stability, and common sense. And 
at risk of beating a dead horse, let me just say this. I've got a message to all the rad libs, CIA, fake socialists, uh, Maoist ultra-leftists, grifters, movementists, cultists. I've got a message to the people who tried to get into this conference earlier today and disrupt, and we got them the hell out of here. If they're watching right now, I've got a message for you. And that message is stay the hell away from us. That's our message, stay the hell away from us. We're not bothering you, you can do your thing. We're not coming to your rallies. If you wanna do your thing and burn a dumpster or whatever, we're not bothering you. We're not bothering you, seriously, we're not bothering you. Mao Zedong said, you fight your way, I fight mine. You fight your way, I fight mine. We're doing our own thing here. This is how we wanna organize because we're serious. And if you don't like it, that's fine. You don't have to participate but you also don't have to bother us. And we will protect our meetings, we will protect ourselves. We protected our meeting here today. I wanna to applaud our security team for the great work they did. The great work they did preventing the attack on this meeting that was coming. There was a huge amount of intimidation to try and keep us from having this meeting today and it failed because we're not afraid and we are here and our message is not going to end and we are gonna do this in Chicago and we're gonna do this in Seattle and we are gonna do this in every corner of this country because people need to hear this message and they need it desperately.